Today, we're going to talk about the five things that I wish someone had told me before I became a manager. Five things I wish someone had told me before I became a manager. So here's how this goes. When, when I became a manager of people, I knew there was some things I would have to learn, some things I'd have to develop. I knew I'd be responsible for making decisions, and including some that may not be popular, and maybe have more say in, in, in even big decisions. I was excited about that. Maybe I'd be in con more in control of things. I didn't, however, anticipate some of the ways my day-to-day -day role would evolve. Here are the five things I wish someone had told me when I was first starting out. Thing one, it's lonely at the top. One of the first thoughts I had as a manager was, wait, where did everybody go? What I discovered was as a leader, your circle changes. You're, you're on a different level than your former peers. In fact, I learned a valuable early lesson about not making that separation from my former peers. What did I learn? They may try to take advantage of you because you used to be their friend and now you're the boss. They may want you to give them special consideration and have their back. And here's the lesson I learned. And this was almost 100% of the case until I learned to not do this. When you need them, huh, they may not always reciprocate as you expected them to. In short, my kindness, my consideration was rarely ever paid back. And I was taken advantage of. Quick story. I hated how I had to deal with my first experience in this lesson. This goes back a long ways and thankfully I learned this early. I had a really tough boss who saw what was happening between my, my friend when I was his peer and me who was now his manager. This guy was now my direct report. And in short, Bill was doing a fairly poor job. He, he was in sales and he was just coasting along on our relationship. And fact is, I was not holding him accountable because of the awkwardness and the fear of ruining the relationship. And thinking back, and I've thought about this a lot, and I've shared this story many times with others in classes and courses, Mr. Hellman was teaching me a valuable lesson. One that I'm, I'm telling you, I, it, I held on to it for my entire corporate career. Story goes like this. One day he pulled me into the office and he told me Bill had to go. Bill had to be fired. And I had to do it. Ah, crap. Ooh, this was the first person I had to fire. And on top of that, he was my friend. He was actually a pretty good friend. I'd go run around town with this guy from bar to bar and having all kinds of young man fun. So I got my gumption up. I got my courage up. I don't think I slept a wink the night before. Sat down with Bill and I fired him. And to say the least, <laughs> it did not go well. I, he blew up like a Roman candle. He called me every name in the book. He stormed out and he never spoke to me again. Do you think I learned a valuable lesson from that? A valuable lesson about management and relationships? Uh, I can tell you I never made that mistake again. Thank goodness, again, Mr. Hellman taught me in my early 20s when I first became a manager how dumb a mistake that was. And I've held on to it ever since. And I'm passing that on to you today. 
because it can be a very difficult adjustment when you're used to having a group of coworkers at your level, you get promoted. And what I, it didn't take me long, but I, I, the best thing I did was to find new cohorts, you know, and they were manager cohorts. These were folks with whom I went through management training with, or managers at other locations, nearby locations. That's, that became people I could relate to better. And it frankly didn't get me in that kind of trouble and create the kind of awkwardness and, and uh, disappointment that I had with Bill. And in the end, when you become a manager, you must understand, you must believe me, that your kindness may be judged as weakness. And anyone you allow to become too close may take advantage of you. Don't trust that they will ever have your back and go the extra mile due to this relationship. They won't. It's okay to connect with them. Like I, I've said on previous podcasts, it's okay to connect and have a relationship. It just cannot be a close personal relationship. You've got to let those go when you become a manager. It's okay to connect, but purely in a professional manner. Watch that line of friendship. And don't cross it. If you do, it'll hurt you. So number two. And I found this out again fairly early, thankfully. But it's not about me anymore. When you become a manager, it's not about you anymore. You see, I, the, what got me there, what got me promoted was I was an executor. I was an achiever. I got stuff done. But being a manager is about much more than that. And I didn't realize it when I first started out. The transition to management means that the days of focusing on exceeding your own goals are gone. Now your focus is on bringing the whole team along to success. It's about the team success, not what you can do, but what you can influence others to do. And how do you get others to have the same drive, enthusiasm, determination, work ethic that you have? Especially when you're used to spending your time cranking out your own work. Well, that's a huge lesson. You'll need to learn to work a different muscle, and that's all about leadership. And that muscle that's focused on leading and growing your team to its own version of success. It's a different level of success. You're going to be judged by not what you know, what you can do, what you can achieve, but what your team now achieves. You must learn to lead. Because no matter how good you are at task, your knowledge will mean little if you cannot translate that as a coach and train your team on the same things you know. Then, once they know it, you've got to inspire and motivate. Motivate them to work hard and achieve the goals. And here's the, here's the important point here. They've got to want to to achieve those goals for you. Remember, always, people work for people, not companies. What they achieve or don't achieve is based on you and your ability to lead. A leader's success isn't measured by how many sales calls they make or lines of code they write. Yeah, I mean, you may find at the end of the day, early on, especially at the end of a long day, sometimes it's really hard to tell what you truly accomplished as a manager that day. It requires a new way of thinking about productivity and success. How many calls and appointments your team has made? How much of the daily list of duties that they accomplished. What can you get done through them in partnership with them, motivate them 
to get things done. Plus, let me give you a big warning here. Don't fall for this mistake of doing it for them. Don't take over and get things done because you can do it better and faster. Almost 100% of the time, not 100%, but almost 100%. I see new managers taking over, taking things out of the hands of their employees, their direct reports, and doing it themselves because they get frustrated. They don't have patience. And mostly because they know they can do it better and faster. Another story in my first role as a manager, let me tell you, I was out to prove the world how great I was and to validate, validate. I wanted everybody to know that I was the right choice for this promotion. And I, I certainly have picked up from my, my other bosses as in the few years as I was coming up. I knew from watching them that I had to lead from the front. Be willing to do what I asked anybody on my team to do. However, many new managers, as I did, take that a bit too far in the early stages because I became the hardest working guy in town. I mean, I was a beast. I was working 14 hour days, skipping days off, literally doing every job there was to do. And in the meantime, completely unknowingly, I'd never had thought about this. I was making a gigantic mistake. Actually, a couple of them. And mistake number one was by doing this, by doing all the work, taking the work out of the hands of the people who, frankly, we were paying to do it. Well, I offended and demoralized some of my team members by doing their job for them and gave them the impression, the unintended impression, I did not trust them to do their jobs. Completely unintended, but I found out in due course what I had done. All under the motivation, I got to get it all done. I got to show everybody how great I am. And it's not about how great I am. It's how great your team is. And the second mistake that correlated with this first mistake was I was teaching team members, my associates, my employees, I was teaching others. If they do something wrong or they're too slow, no problem. Vaughn will do it for you. Let me tell you, that is a deep hole you dig yourself. And if you think for a minute by them watching you Work your fanny off is motivating to them. It ain't. If you think you're teaching them by showing them only how to do it, you're not teaching them. What you're teaching them is, hey, Vaughn will take care of it for me. Just stand around long enough, Vaughn will take care of it. Pretty sure that's not what you want. So think about that. Don't make that mistake. Third thing, this is on a little bit more on the positive side, but when I was coming up, I was used to winning. I was used to achieving. I was used to being the top dog and outperforming a lot of people. It was a sales job. And it's true. As much as it feels great to beat your own goals, I finally realized once I figured out how to do this, it's even more thrilling to win as a team. There is a lot of joy in knowing you've supported people, you've motivated people to do their best work and achieve their goals, which are your goals. And the impact you can make as a whole team is much bigger than anything you alone could achieve. Now, how do you do this? Well, a key component of this is you have to have great communication skills and be able through those great communication skills, be able to inspire your team to perform for you at a fairly high level. And on that subject, for listening 
for watching the Business Mechanic Show. I'll give you a free offer. I'm going to give you a free offer for listening. Use the link in the show notes and take advantage of our course, Effective Communication, for free. Absolutely free. You'll get the key knowledge required to communicate, work smarter, not harder, and gain the skills, tools to get the most out of your interactions with your team, your peers, and your boss. Click on that free course and take advantage of it. You'll learn a lot, I promise you. Things you didn't even know you needed to learn, but it'll make a lot of sense. Check it out, and I'm glad to provide that for you. If, give me some feedback. If it works for you, you get some success, or even if you have some questions, reach out to me. Vaughn at rdltraining.com, and let's talk. So moving on, here's a key leadership tip for you. Remember that when your team wins, this is key. Remember when your team wins, the credit goes to them, not you. Never can you take full or even partial credit for your team's accomplishments. You probably had a lot to do with it, but you've got to shove that success and the accolades for that success back on your team. Again, I had to learn this early. And conversely, when they fail, the team fails, you come up short, you're coming up short, your team is coming up short because of you. And in that case, you must accept all the blame. You've got to always protect your team and always have their back. Again, I had to learn this early because it is common human self-esteem ego to find blame when things go wrong. To look around, find somebody else and get that blame off of you. But as a leader, a true leader, a successful leader that's going to inspire and motivate people, everything that goes wrong is your fault. Don't blame it on anybody else but you. Just don't do it. Take the blame, own it, learn how to not let it happen again, and then move on. And even if you feel it's not your fault, it's your fault. And as I hone this skill, this being able to eat it, own it, I got to tell you, my boss has really appreciated this in me. And they'll appreciate it in you if you're willing to put your ego aside, right or wrong, and take the blame for it. Your team will really appreciate that. Just that, that act of you taking the bullet inspires them that you've got their back. And like I said, my boss has really appreciated from this from me that I would always take the blame. And, and here's how that, that sounded when the, blo the boss brought something to my attention. You're right. I screwed up. I'll fix it. And I'll do everything I can to not let it happen again. You're right. I'll fix it. And it'll never happen again. And then... By the way, you need to go fix it. <laughs> you need to find out what causes that, what needs to be adjusted, what you need to do differently, learn from your mistakes, and fix it. And yeah, don't let it happen again. That's a key point of leadership. Tip number four I wish someone had told me before I became a manager. You can't always do it better. Huh, maybe you can, but you can't. You've probably had former managers who did things that made you think, when I'm a manager, I'll never do that. And that's a great daydream, a great daydream. It's not always reality. Until I finally realized that I didn't really understand some past manager's decisions. I didn't agree with them. I didn't understand them. 
I didn't understand the decision or the actions until I started advancing a little bit as a manager and finding out the fact is while it seems like as a manager, you hold all the power, sometimes your hands are tied and you can't make the changes that you feel strongly you should make in order to make a difference. You can't make those changes because your hands are tied, even if you want to. Sometimes you have to give hard feedback or difficult answers, even when you know it will not be very popular. Being liked, by the way, is not required to be a leader. You must be respected. But our need to be liked sometimes can undermine us. Be careful with that. You need to earn respect. Because believe me, I like to be liked. Most people like to be liked. Early on, I wanted everyone to like me. And I made some, some mistakes. Had I known better, I wouldn't have gotten the disappointed or disappointed my boss or even disappointed my associates had I known better. But let me get back to the point. I almost drove up into a ditch there. I didn't realize early, early in my career that in management, decisions sometimes get made way above my pay grade, come down, and I've got to follow them no matter what. I got to follow through with them no matter what even if I don't agree. Your hands are tied. However, the key to this is, again, you have to own it. You've got to filter this message, this decision, this action. Filter the message in a way that makes it your decision. Own it, not blame it on your boss or on corporate. Own it. You must, as a leader within your organization, support these decisions, or at least in the eyes of your employees, your associates, you've got to support it. Because remember always, they work for the company. I'm sorry, I just screwed that up. Remember, they work for you, not the company. It's all part of being a leader and doing what's best for the larger team or organization. That said, there are certainly lessons from former managers that I carry with me today. Watch them, learn from them. Some of those things were things not to do, and others were things I, I strive for and remember day after day. So learn from others. And also understand that very often you're out of control when it comes to decisions that come from above. That's the way working for a company and organization, corporations, that's the way it is. But you got to own it. Number five, people are paying attention. Always. As, a, as an individual contributor, the circle of people who notice your success or your failure is important, but it's not necessarily extensive. But as a manager, as a manager, a lot more eyes are on you. How you react, how you interact and lead, that all impacts your team. And it's imperative to be unbiased, respectful, Follow the rules as you expect others. Be positive because your team feeds off of you. Deploy equal accountability. Deploy equal expectations. Don't show favoritism in any way, even if you don't think it's favoritism. There's so many unintended consequences that you can fall a trap to. Be careful. Be aware of that. You're being watched. You're being judged by what you say and do all day, every day. By your peers, certainly by your associates. 
and I often describe this to managers that are going through my courses. It's like a documentary film crew is following you everywhere you go, all day, every day. You got a you got a camera on you, and they're capturing your every move, your every word. You do not realize how your associates are watching and judging you all day, every day. Actions, your actions, that you perceive as kind of minor, inconsequential, can have an outside, outsized effect on someone you manage. So it's important to be mindful. Even little things said or done sometimes are blown up in the perception that someone, how they translate that. So you got to be careful. Be careful with your words. Be careful with your actions. Know that you're being watched. And always be conscious of the unintended perception that you may create. And here is another huge tip. And this really comes into play when you have an underperformer on your team. Don't live with them. Don't tolerate them. You've got to deal with them. Don't think the problem will fix itself. Don't procrastinate because it won't fix itself. And your procrastination is very damaging to you. Is very damaging to you. Don't think that no one else is really caring about this. Believe me, everybody on your team cares. They see it, and every day you tolerate it, they are judging you, and they're not judging you positively. Don't avoid it. You must confront it. You've got to deal with it and either fix them or replace them. ASAP. And by doing so, it sends a strong message to your associates that you have high standards and you're going to enforce them. Because every day, every minute you live with an underperformer, your leadership perspective diminishes and is being undermined. So those are the five things I wish someone had told me and I knew before I became a manager. And hey, now you've got them too. I'd love to hear your comments, share your thoughts. Let's wrap this up. The saying, what got you here won't get you there, applies to nothing, if not management. When you get promoted, what got you here, that's great, but it won't get you there. It won't, it will, what got you to your promotion will not make you successful as a manager You've got to become a better leader because leading a team is a skill. And regardless of how excellent you were in your previous role, nobody cares. It's an entirely different ball game to manage people doing their job well. And it requires humility, a willingness to learn, and a strong sense of teamwork all on your part. Come visit rdltraining.com. That's Romeo Delta Lima training.com and check out all of our training, our management leadership courses, and our coaching services. And especially check out our online training courses, one of which I wish I'd had when I was first setting out. And that's called How to Be an Inspirational Leader. And again, in the show notes, there's a link to that course. And I'm telling you, it comes from the heart. It comes from my experience. Tony Penn, my partner in RDL training, uh, conducts the course. He offers a lot of his own experiences in that. It's great. You'll learn a lot and it will set you up for even more success in your career. Click on the link in the show notes and check it out. Thanks to all of you, as always. The listenership is going through the roof. I cannot tell you how happy that makes me and how proud it makes me. Thanks for listening, as always. 
And if you want to consult with me on any of our services, contact me at the website, rdltraining.com.